This time on the Highland Woodworker. So my goal was to have it as loud as I could get it, and it is about three times louder than a normal music box. From music boxes to intricate furniture design, even to life-size hand-carved statues, master woodworker Dennis Zonker does it all. We'll take you to his impressive Nebraska workshop and get a first-hand look at his work and his order of operations for making these one-of-a-kind heirloom pieces. Plus, Popular Woodworking Magazine has some miter good tips for you. <laughs> These stories and more, this time on the Highland Woodworker. Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. I just love coming to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia. It's where I get all my fine woodworking tools and a great woodworking education. Master woodworker Dennis Zonker creates beautiful custom furniture and detailed life-size sculptures. His passion for hands-on old world craftsmanship and his excitement for high-tech tools intersect daily at his spacious Omaha, Nebraska workshop. Let's go meet Dennis there now in our moment with a master. Well, we're in Dennis Zonker's Collection Corner. Dennis, it's just great to be here. This is just some beautiful woodworking. Now, I understand that this table and chest set are very instrumental in your growth and development. Tell me about it. Well, <clears throat> this piece was uh, like a step up for me. The first 10 years, I made a lot of furniture for customers that was, you know, simple and plain. And then I just uh, like started getting, because I really love turning on the lathe. So I started thinking about a chess set and table and chairs. So I started with the chess pieces. And uh, so then I decided that I wanted to base everything off of my chess pieces. These are the same style of shape of my rooks and my and the king. And this this around here is like a castle, and there's a castle move in the chess game. So that turned out really good. And then I have the separate colors of maple is the light color and walnut is the darker color. Like in so many of your pieces, there is a theme. Yeah. Like this has the chess theme into it, but it's also a workable piece of furniture. And underneath <clears throat> the pedestal is very interesting. Yeah, the, uh, it's the same king as the chess set, but it's scaled up nine times. And the same thing with the knights. <clears throat> and then they're connected by these legs with some big mortise and tenons. And this set I made uh, um, 21 years ago. And then over here is the chairs that go with it. <clears throat> and I kind of kept the theme, the same theme as the chess table with the queen, a queen's body, an abstract of a woman's body. And then this is the, her crown, the queen crown, the same as the chess piece, and also the, the bishops and the pawns. That, well, that's wonderful. Um, you are not a flat border. No. I mean, everywhere you look in your work, you find just exquisite, beautiful curves mm -hmm. that you've planned out and scaled. Uh, and some of them are your very own curves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, show us some boxes. And, and tell us about how you've incorporated uh, your theme okay. type work into the boxes. My first box was this rose box, and I wanted to incorporate carving into a box, which can be kind of complicated without making it look too gaudy. So I did all this roses and leaves in a low relief carving. I had like a medallion here, and this is solid ebony. And then I kept the theme in the front with the roses and vines. Because when you open it up, you're not finished. No. Yeah. Then you get, the, I have marquetry of the same exact roses, which is as bloodwood and fruitwood and, and walnut. And butterfly keys. Yeah, that run all the way through. So they're kind of like a sliding key that keeps the joint together. That's great. <clears throat> and then my favorite box here is this music box. And I think it's my favorite because I had to uh, come up with the, to where it would sound really good. So that was really important to me to have the sound and a good quality box. And all this is veneered. The core of the substrates are all plywood and hardwood. So I first had to figure out the design of like the sound holes and the bottom. It has to be a thin bottom so it can vibrate with the 
72 note movement. So and then I also decided to put ebony inlays. So I did these segmented legs and I have ebony in all, between all these pieces of trim. So and then I'll, also on the top layer here. So it kind of all goes together. What I did at the top with marquetry, um, there's about 160 pieces in this top and the top is done with ma mahogany. And the inside, the violins are done with bloodwood. Just beautiful, can you play it for us? Sure. So my goal was to have it as loud as I could get it, and it is about three times louder than a normal music box. It's beautiful. Uh, I would guess that it came from the Black Forest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that is just phenomenal. And when you close it, yeah, you can it sounds even better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. And this is a harp, <clears throat> so I kind of want to, I always like to have the, the theme, you know, everywhere I can find a theme to go with a piece. Well, you can't be Dennis Zonker and have just a regular old metal desk. This desk would inspire anyone. Uh, tell us about this, Dennis. Well, this is a piece I did for myself um, because I wanted to, I love lions, and I wanted to sit behind a desk that made me feel, you know, like I was a craftsman. The marquetry theme is the lion king in front, and there's about 300 different pieces of veneer that I use to get that marquetry, and the further back you get away from it, the more, like it, you can't tell that it's veneers. Just beautiful, and it's got marquetry uh, on the ends. Mm -hmm, yeah, on one end is a cub, and on the other end is a female lion, and I use wengi for the legs with uh, paduke, for the for these bottom feet and then also for the top is out of paduke yeah this table here is i call it the griffin table because the lion's face and the eagle win, wings are, uh, is called a griffin so i made this piece about 14 years ago for myself and i wanted to have the rose theme on the top and then the the griffin theme on the on the base of it this was the <clears throat> very first time that I had to go to clay to figure out my carving because there's just so much to this with the with the pyramid or the triangle and getting that shape and getting to fit flat and also come out where I needed it. So I just did it in clay first and then I and then I used calipers and <clears throat> measured it all over to the wood when I started carving. So you do a full size? Yeah. In clay. Yeah. Yeah, and that gives you something to work from. Yeah, you, then you can see exactly what you want to build, and you can't really make a mistake that way. Dennis also used clay to help guide him in the creation of his life-size masterpiece of the Crucifixion of Christ. It took 10 months to complete this hand-carved statue. He did it all in this historic Omaha workshop. Built in the 1800s, when it was the home of the Metz Brothers Brewery, one of the first beer makers in Nebraska. Wow, this is a great space. <laughs> Looks like you got a machine area over there with everything that anybody would want to, to uh, uh, cut materials to size. Mm -hmm. And you've got a lot of your sculpting basswood here. It looks yeah, like. that's where I keep my stock for gluing up and carving wood and your substrates it, yeah this is it but this is not all of it no well you know Dennis what inspired you to get into woodworking what was the the first little <clears throat> smoldering flame well when I was younger I played in a band professionally and then my wife had we had a baby so I wanted to make better money so and so I went to go work for a cabinet shop and, you know, it was cheap cabinets, but I liked it. And uh, eventually, you know, I started really getting into it. And uh, I started building furniture on the side in my garage. Then I just decided that uh, I was gonna just try to make it into a living. And I could make pretty good money, or at least make better money than being a, a musician. Then I started, uh, slowly just started uh, getting commission jobs. And eventually, you know, we built it up to this size of a company. Well, let's take a look at, at some of the rest of it. You, you really have everything that anybody would need to build uh, custom furniture. I mean, this is an excellent spray booth. 
Yeah, this is uh, really nice because it's concrete walls and all these filters. We turn on the fan and it's dust free basically. This is a bed, very contemporary. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a walnut bed and it's gonna have lights around the bottom of it. And this is the backboard of the bed. And it's made out of sappy walnut veneered. Truly one of a kind is what you do. Oh, well, yeah. Let's see the rest of it. Sure. Well, just great equipment. You've got a dovetail machine there, an yeah. Italian dovetail yeah. machine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, got a couple of great table saws. Uh, everything you need to break down stock. Wow. This is something I've always wanted. This is a marvelous panel saw. Yeah, this is a Holzer panel saw from Germany, and it is amazing how you can cut big panels vertically and horizontal, or even small panels. <clears throat> it's very good for production, and it's, it just runs like a Mercedes, and it's, and it's digital, and... Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a big uh, addition to cutting, because a lot of times in the shop when all the guys are working, there's a guy on each table saw, and then you have a guy on the panel saw, you know, so it gives but you an extra. everybody here is working on a custom piece. Yeah, they're working on a custom piece, like a conference table or a desk or something. Well, Dennis, I happen to know that besides being an outstanding artist, that one of the reasons for your success is right here. Tell us about this. Well, <clears throat> everything that we make here is has to be designed and engineered on a blueprint first. And that way um, the shop can be more efficient and uh, the customer knows what they're getting. You know, usually we get almost 100% of the time, 90% of the time we get the drawings approved before, before building it. So they know exactly what they're getting. Um, so there's a lot, of time, a lot of time up front before you actually get into building it. And y'all keep a sheet with all the cost on it. Yeah. Uh, and, and Materials, you, labor, everything. We it, track it on You kind of know that before you start, at least as an estimate. Yeah. And then you have something to work toward. Yeah. Because you got to pay the bills and you got to make a profit. <laughs> That's right. Or all of this goes away. That's it, right. And you've been successful for how long? 30 years. Wow. Well, Dennis, this is just a wonderful shop. Uh, you've got the best of all equipment plenty of room, and <laughs> I love the Festool Capex. <laughs> it's a great miter saw. Look at all the projects going on, and these are all custom projects. It's what really every woodworker who owned a business would really like to do. This is not a production shop. No, every piece here is uh, designed, engineered, and built to be a heirloom piece of furniture. So. Well, you have done just an amazing job with this. Well. You're a sculptor, a carver, a marketeer, if you will, a box maker, a turner, all of those things. And how would you like to be remembered? Uh, I think I would like to be remembered as a, a really good furniture maker or a woodworker, and that uh, you know that they knew I was humble, and that uh, you know, of course, my family. You know, my kids and everything, that they, you know, think I'm a great dad too, you know. But, uh, but as far as the woodworking goes, yeah, I'd love to be remembered as, you know, just a good woodworker that was a good person. Later in the show, we'll head back to Dennis Zonker's shop, where he shows us how he turns his detailed ideas into woodworking reality. But first, some shortcuts for making great cuts on your miter saw. Stay with us. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. I'm just an average down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm probably about a 5. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here. And I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw. And there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop. 
Whiteside Machine Company has been in business for over 30 years providing customers with quality router bits. Fine Woodworking Magazine has declared Whiteside Router Bits best overall and best value when compared against 17 other brands. No matter the router application, they have the type and profile of carbide router bit you need. When you put a white side router bit to work in your shop, it is guaranteed to make you smile. Meet the Bora Centipede, the lightweight and portable workshop table that supports up to 3,000 pounds, stores in a small space for tight shops, and opens into a work table to bring your work to a comfortable height. This makes the perfect companion for your track saw. Comes with X cups and hold downs to secure your work. Upgrade your shop today. I've been using Forest products for years. You know, they're the maker of the Woodworker 2 saw blade. Gives great cuts on your table saw every time. Now, I have a chop master for my miter saw. I have a dense piece of two by two walnut, and as you see, it cuts like butter, leaving clean cuts at 90 degrees. Forest, the cuts will make you smile every time. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for more than 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, just look in their catalog or go to highlandwoodworking.com. Hey, David here back in the Popwood shop. Today we're gonna to show you three quick miter saw hacks that'll make your saw work better for you. All miter saws have a fence to support the material as you're making the cut. This one actually has a very nice fence. Not all of them are quite this tricked out. You'll also notice that these have holes drilled in the bottom of the fence. Why is that? That's so you can attach an auxiliary fence or a sacrificial fence because sometimes you need to cut something that's longer than the standard fence and you need support. So you take a simple piece of plywood that's the length that you need and using those screw holes drill from the back into this and attach your sacrificial fence. Now if your saw doesn't happen to have those holes already drilled in it, nine times out of ten it's an aluminum fence Drill some holes in it. It's your fence, it's your saw, you can do what you want and you'll use it to mount things every time. Make it your own. Another advantage of having your new fence is that you can use it to help align for cuts. Instead of having to bring the blade down and trying to align to your pencil line and trying to sneak up on which side it's on and testing your eyesight, you can simply go ahead and make a cut through your fence at the angle that you need. Now it's a simple matter of bringing your piece over and aligning it to the perfect kerf right there. Now, you will need to change your fence as you change your cuts, but if you have a set like this, you're always gonna have a perfect cut. With our kerf line on our fence, we can make perfect cuts, right? Well, not always, because I didn't have it perfectly aligned. Now, it's very hard to bring a blade into that little bit of sliver accurately. So how do we do that? Well, we sneak up on it by using the uh, adjustment in the blade, or actually the looseness of the blade. You bring the miter saw blade down, push your piece up against it, and give it a little extra push to actually shift the blade a little bit. Then, holding it in place, bring the blade up, and then make your cut.
that little bit of adjustment, that little bit of play in the arbor and the blade itself allows you to sneak up on the cut perfectly. You're not hurting the arbor, you're not hurting the blade, but it allows you to take a very, very tight, simple cut, a sliver cut, and sneak up on your miter joint. Coming up, Dennis Zunker walks us through his project design process. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. For 35 years, Lee has manufactured the world's best joinery jigs. From our award-winning dovetail jigs and mortise and tenon jigs, to newer innovations like router table jigs. Easily add strong, beautiful joinery to your woodworking pieces, like half-blind dovetails, box joints, mortise and tenon joints, and through dovetails. Lee, simply the easiest and most versatile router joinery jigs. Highland Woodworking stocks a wide selection of Rikon power tools known for their innovative design and rugged durability. Highland has sold thousands of Rikon's industry-leading bandsaws with sizes to fit every woodworking need, from the compact affordable 10-inch model to competitively priced 14 and 18-inch models. Shop us also for Rikon's reliable planers, lathes, and professional low-speed grinder, all with an exceptional five-year warranty. Rikon. Power tools. This show is about sculpture that rocks. Watch it at charlesbrockchairmaker.com. Let's go. If you can't make it to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia, you can shop online at highlandwoodworking.com. They're great at getting what you want to your shop quick. Let Highland's legendary wood slicer resaw blade help make it easy for you to get great results sawing thick lumber into thinner boards. The wood slicer is designed to cut much faster, smoother, and quieter than ordinary bandsaw blades. You'll be amazed at how smooth a surface you'll get with a wood slicer. Its variable tooth pattern greatly reduces noise and vibration. Order a wood slicer from Highland Woodworking for your bandsaw today. Hopefully, artistry requires a system, and I think this is where you start. Tell us about your library. Well, back when I first started, there wasn't, you know, computers like they are today, you know. So <clears throat> I would buy any type of woodworking book that I could find or magazine and read them. I'd go to old bookstores and find some old books on woodworking and furniture and history of furniture and the different types of furniture and different time periods. And I just was so engulfed in reading and studying. <clears throat> but this really helped me. You know, you read enough about it, uh, it, it really gives you an insight on what you need to do. You know, and a lot of the older books are nice because they would show the you know good joinery and all that stuff and and then I'm also a history buff on old time furniture makers in the past um, like the Rogdens, Herder Brothers, Link, uh, Francis Link. I mean, there's just so many of them that if you really look in the past on furniture making, there's a lot of them back there. You know, or a lot of them out there. So, so you get a client 
somebody approaches you and says, I need a piece of furniture for this purpose or kind of turns you loose to create something. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got this uh, packed into your brain or yeah. an opportunity <laughs> to come over and, and, yeah. and read some more. And so it goes from there to where? Well, then I uh, just work with the customer on what design they want. And I, <clears throat> I draw an AutoCAD. I'm an AutoCAD junkie. I've been doing it for a long time. But this was a design <clears throat> that I did for a dining room table. This is the, like the construction part of the, the joinery, the dovetails, and how things are fastened together. And then this is the design that I sent to the customer. Uh, these pink lines right here are my <clears throat> marquetry lines where I cut it out. And I didn't send those, that with the, to the drawing. I didn't send those pink lines with the drawing, but that was something I did afterwards. And this uh, table was uh, called the oak leaf table and chairs. You know, everything that I've learned from carving and marquetry and furniture making, I put it in. This is one of the most difficult pieces that I had to make, but it was one of the most enjoyable and the customer wanted it right away. And uh, so I did it in six months when it really should have took me a year, but I just, I really had to push hard, but I enjoyed that part of it too though. Okay, so from here, how would you take it from here and work through some of the, uh, the carving? Uh, from here, like these legs, to figure them out exactly, I would make them in clay. And then I could model the clay. I make a full size corner of the table, like this up here, the, <clears throat> the top edges and apron and everything. And then from there, I'd make an armature and then I'd just do everything in clay so I could really see what the leg looks like. And then, <clears throat> then I could use that as a model using calipers and measuring, seamstress tape measure, and then transfer it to the wood. And then I could carve, carve in the details and get the leg exactly the same as the uh, clay model. Clay. Uh, tell me about how you use it. Well, this is oil-based clay, so it never hardens, which is good because then if, you, if you're working on something like this for a month, then you never have to worry about it hardening. And you can also make a bronze out of it, out of it if you wanted to. Okay. <clears throat> but this one I'm just doing to uh, copy the carving part of it, but I'm just working out all the details. Um, this is the 14 stations of the cross. This is uh, the first station where Jesus is condemned to death. And uh, I've finished these two characters and then I'm starting over here. And it's just gonna be a relief carving but I try to get it as still as detailed and uh, anatomy proportioned correctly, you know. Like if you have an arm too big someplace, yeah. it's easier to fix it yeah. right here. Well, especially when you have multiple people, you know, this is, this is going to be four people and um, to just draw it out on the, just use a drawing over the top of it, I just figured that, you know, I could really get my face details down <clears throat> and stuff like that and all the like the feet and the hand detail. And it makes it easier when you go into wood. Dennis, I just love to see you in action. You've got a great collection of, of carving tools here. Well, thank you. These, the carving knives that I use are called Feel and they're Swiss made and they, they are the best in the world. And I have about 150 of them. A lot of my smaller carvings, <clears throat> I use this, this vise here. This vise I bought about 22 years ago, and it was like a thousand bucks. Wow. And I don't even remember the name of it, but it's very heavy duty, and I can rotate this in any position that I want to. So like if I'm getting into the difficult areas, you know, I can come over here like this, and then I can take my chisels and I can get down in here, and it's very, <clears throat> it's very good for your body too, because you don't have to, you know, if you had this in a, a flat position somewhere, you'd have to go in very weird angles yeah, to get to it. Orientation to work is so very important oh, for the yeah. brain, for your body, and for just work in general. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, the articulation of, of this vice is just marvelous. Well, I'll tell you what, Dennis, I have enjoyed today. I what? have too. <laughs> that was well, a blast. I'm, I'm, thank you. This has just been wonderful. You are the real thing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
and he had great tools. But he did not have one of these. He did not have an app. He did not have Bluetooth. What he did have were great tools that did a wonderful job, like a pocket knife and like one of these folding rules for inside measurements. He always had this in his back pocket. Well, in his front pocket, he always carried a Stanley rule. And this is a 175th anniversary limited edition of a 1933 model Stanley rule. Uh, beautiful chrome case. Uh, it's got a half inch wide blade and it's got a hook on the end. Uh, everything going for it, but the best thing is it fits right here. Uh, it is just wonderful to hold, is well balanced, and is going to be with you all the time. Now, if it was good enough for my grandfather, it's going to be good enough for you. If you want one, go to Highland Woodworking, highlandwoodworking.com. They have these wonderful Stanley rules. In fact, they're the only ones that do have them and get your limited edition because they're going fast and pretty soon they'll be gone. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. That's all the time we have for the show today. But check us out on social media and come back to see us next time on the Highland Woodworker.